What is very clear is that we are now facing three global threats, uh, nuclear war, climate change, and technological disruption. And these global challenges cannot be solved on a national basis. There is nothing that a single nation can do by itself to prevent nuclear war or to prevent climate change or to regulate the explosive potential of technologies like AI and bioengineering. You must have global cooperation on that. Whether we'll actually have global cooperation, I don't know. Uh, we should never underestimate human stupidity. Humans often make decisions which are not in their best interest. Well, this is very frightening because, I mean, if you look at Donald Trump at the UN this week, for example, mm -hmm. global cooperation is in tatters, isn't it? Yeah. How, what do you do when the leader of the Western world has sort of checked out of cooperating globally? Um, it's very clear that going forward, we just cannot rely on the US to lead the world in the way that countries relied on it in, in the last few decades. Uh, I don't know why the US not only undermines the global order, but even its own alliances. I mean, even if you think the world is becoming a dangerous place and there are all these growing arms races and competition with China and so forth, you should keep your allies closer. You shouldn't distance them. And for some reason, the current US government is just systematically attacking and distancing its own best allies, whether it's Canada or whether it's Germany or whether it's Japan and South Korea. Why, you should ask the uh, US president. Well, because it's America first, Trump would say, if he was sitting right here. Yeah, but even if you want America first, you need allies. Mm. Why pick fights, unnecessary fights with your allies? Uh, it, 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 it's unclear. but. But if we, if we can't rely on America to lead mm -hmm. the world, who would you like to rely on? Who should we rely on? It can't be a single country. It has to be a cooperation of a lot of countries. Um, but and can China step into the role that America has? To some extent, certainly on climate change, Amer China is stepping into this vacuum. Um, but again, if, if you think about climate change, it's, it's obvious that you need maybe not all countries, but most countries on board in order to effectively counter the threat of climate change. And it's the same with, again, the, the rise of artificial intelligence and bioengineering. If you're afraid of genetic engineering of human babies or of the uh, creation of killer robots and autonomous weapon systems, this is something that you cannot prevent or regulate on a national basis. If only the EU or only Britain uh, forbids genetic engineering of humans or forbids uh, development of killer robots, but the Chinese and the Americans and the Israelis and the Iranians do it, then you won't achieve much. Very soon even the Europeans will be tempted to break their own ban because nobody would like to stay behind. If we have an arms race in artificial intelligence, this almost guarantees the worst outcome. Do you have any sympathy, though, with the, the Trump worldview that global institutions have failed the people? I mean, that was in some ways what was behind Brexit as well. That, you mm -hmm. know, the, the institution of the European Union was failing people living here. Um, certainly there are problems in the system, like, you know, in every system there, there are problems, but the idea that the system is completely broken, we need to just uh, uh, start afresh, this I think is, is quite crazy. Uh, the world in the early 21st century, and certainly in the West, was never in better shape. Um, it's the first time in history that violence kills fewer people than accidents, that famine kills fewer people than obesity, and that infectious diseases kill fewer people than old age. Uh, we are healthier and safer and more prosperous than in any previous time in history. So we should be more optimistic about the future. We should be more optimistic, we should be more grateful. I mean, one of the problems is if you just take the current situa for, situation for granted and focus on the problems, and there are lots of problems, but if you just focus on the problems and you forget the achievements of the last few decades, you risk losing everything. If you think things are bad now, you know nothing about how, wh how much worse things can get very, very quickly. You say in the book that liberalism has no obvious answers to the big challenges of mm -hmm. today, including technological disruption. So let's yeah. talk about AI. 
What makes you think that the technological revolution that we're currently going through is going to be any more challenging than the industrial revolution, mm. where I think you say in the book that for every job lost to a machine, at least one new job was created. So mm. why is this tougher this time? Well, there are two different issues. There is a job market and there is more generally what this revolution is going to do. If we leave the job market aside for, for a bit and, and come back to it later, on the general level, the difference now is that we are, for the first time in history, acquiring the technology to re-engineer life, to re-engineer the world inside us. Uh, un until today, if you look at the big revolutions in history, uh, in agriculture, in industry, which we learned how to manipulate and change the world outside us how to domesticate animals and cut down forests and build cities and roads and bridges and all that. This is all the world outside. We still had very little control over what's happening inside us, our bodies, our brains, our minds. The next revolution, the really big thing, will not be the power to change the world outside, to build faster vehicles, to build taller buildings or things like that. No, the really big revolution is that for the first time we'll have very effective tools to re-engineer the world inside us. It sounds the, Orwellian. Um, it's much more than Orwellian. I mean, you know, 1984, George Orwell, you had social engineering. You did not have, uh, in, in Orwell's fantasy, a dystopian world, the ability to re-engineer the body and the brain. Uh, and this is what we're talking about. So what do we the, do about that? What do we do? Um, first of all, let's make it the first item on our political agenda. Let's, make it, let's be aware that we are really acquiring divine abilities of creation and destruction. For the first time, we are going to have the ability to re-engineer life, to re-engineer bodies and brains and minds. And we have no idea what to do with these powers. If we just leave it to the free market, or if we just leave it to an, to an arms race, it, it guarantees the worst outcome. Which Both is why we need those global institutions that are currently being pulled apart. Yeah, I mean, if you just, you know, if you have an arms race in these technologies, then it's very clear what kind of human abilities are going to be optimized. It will be things like intelligence, things like discipline. Armies and corporations and governments, they want highly intelligent and highly disciplined uh, soldiers and workers and citizens. But other things like uh, compassion, like uh, artistic appreciation, like spirituality, these are things that are not on a very high on the list of armies and corporations. So the attempt to upgrade humans might actually result in downgraded humans, like what we do to the, to the animals. If you compare a domesticated cow to a wild cow, so a domesticated cow produces more milk and is far more obedient, but in almost every other respect, it's a downgrade from the, from the wild cows. And we are on the verge of maybe doing the same thing to human beings. If, if you mentioned Orwell, just think about 1984 or North Korea, where every citizen has a biometrics bracelet on the wrist, which constantly measures your blood, blood pressure and heartbeat and brain activity and so forth. So the government knows not only where you go and whom you meet and what you say, but it knows your emotional state every second of the day. If you look at a picture of Kim Jong-un on the wall and you feel angry, you're in the gulag tomorrow morning because they know you're angry. This is why you don't have a smartphone, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that, yeah, I, I need time to write books. You know, the smartphone is, a, is, a, is a, uh, a machine for capturing your attention. It constantly tries to grab your attention. And if you try to, to write books, it, it, it doesn't work. I mean, you've admitted that it's a kind of privileged position to be able to take, not to own a smartphone. Yeah, it, it's the new status symbol. If you're really important, you don't have a smartphone. If you have a boss, you have a smartphone. Because they need to get hold of you and control you. To yeah, I mean, I mean, the boss wants you. I mean, previously, five o'clock, the end of the shift, you go home, that's it. You're beyond reach. But now in more and more professions, the boss wants to be able to get hold of you, to get your attention um, anytime, anywhere. Who's going to win this AI arms race, do you think? 
I hope that humanity will win. <laughs> if, if it will be an arms race between, say, the West and China, whoever wins, humanity will be the loser. Because an arms race means you cannot regulate it and you cannot prevent the worst outcomes. We've talked about the existential threat of AI, from AI, but uh, what about the jobs threat? Mm. I mean, what work is safe? If you want to tell your kids now, you know, pursue X profession because that's going to mm. be safe from AI, what would it be? It's the first time in history we have no idea whatsoever what the job market would look like in 30 or 40 years, which means that also for the first time in history, we don't really know what kind of skills uh, will be most important and what to teach kids today. It's not a future problem. Okay, when we get to 2050, we'll figure it out. No, we need to think about it today because what do you teach kids today in school? And the best bet, because we don't know, the only thing we know is that it will be a very volatile job market. Uh, things will change very rapidly. The idea of a job for life or a profession for life, this is completely obsolete. I mean, it's been obsolete for a while, that has, hasn't it? Yeah, it, 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 it's, it, the pace is just accelerating. I mean, some people imagine that the automation revolution will be this big single watershed event, like 2025, you have the big automation revolution, 50% of jobs disappear, new jobs emerge, you have a few rough years, and then everything settles down to some new equilibrium. But it won't be like that. It will be a cascade of ever bigger disruptions. You have one big disruption in 2025, and then an even bigger disruption in 2035, an even bigger one in 2045, and so forth. So even if you get a new job, even if new jobs emerge, they too will change and disappear. So the one thing we know for sure that people will need is the ability to retrain and reinvent themselves again and again and again. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. The worst thing, I mean, the worst problems will actually pro be psychological. You'll need a lot of support from the government in unemployment benefits and education for adults and things like that to enable you to make the transition. But above all, you will need a lot of uh, uh, mental balance and emotional intelligence to constantly reinvent yourself without just breaking down. It's so stressful. I mean, you know, when you're 15 or 20, it's very difficult to invent yourself. But when you're 40 or 50, it's much, much more difficult. And is that why you meditate? Uh, for me, I find a lot of mental balance and peace in meditation. So I practice uh, Vipassana meditation two hours a day, and every year I go to a long retreat of 60 days or so. Two hours a day is a lot. I mean, I, I, there's no way I could manage two hours of peace um, and quiet. Well, you know, it, 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 it's individual, but for me I find that uh, the kind of focus and clarity that the meditation gives me is such that it actually pays off, even in terms just of my workload. I manage to do in, in, in five hours what I would otherwise take 10 hours to do. This so, is where I'm going wrong. It, um, <laughs> so. The book paints a, quite a bleak picture in many ways of the mm -hmm. future and all the challenges that are facing us. And yet you're also optimistic that today's problems are easier to solve than the problems of the past century and more. Why is that? No, I'm, I'm not sure they're easier. I'm just saying that it, it, it's possible. I mean, I tend to focus on the more negative scenarios, not because uh, I think they're inevitable. If they're inevitable, there is no point talking about it. Um, but because I think we can still do something about it. We can still prevent climate change. We can still regulate artificial intelligence and biotechnology. It's not too late, uh, but we need to do it now, not in 20 years or 30 years. In 20 years, it will be too late. And are we focusing on the wrong things? Because there's an amazing figure in, in the book um, which talks about terrorists killing 25,000 people globally each year against 1.25 million killed in traffic accidents. Diabetes and sugar kills three and a half million. Air pollution, seven million. Mm -hmm. So why do we focus so much on the terrorists? Because terrorists, they know one thing very, very well. They know how to grab attention. The world now is really, the, 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 maybe the most scarce resource is attention. And there is a huge battle to, to get hold of people's attention. And terrorists are just amazing in successfully grabbing our attention, uh, they know how to press our emotional buttons, 
how to press the fear button above all. If you want to get somebody's attention, fear and violence are the easiest way to do it. They, they, are, they don't have a lot of military power, they don't have an army, but they stage these spectacles of violence which catch our attention. They kill maybe a few people, but cause millions of people to fear for their lives. And they actually hijack our own imagination and use it against us. Our own imagination is becoming an agent of the terrorists, constantly retelling, restaging uh, this spectacle of violence in our minds. And this is the source of their power. And you say, therefore, that the media should uh, be less hysterical, I think is the word you use, about terrorism, and, and politicians too. But it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, 25,000 is still a big number of people mm -hmm. killed by terrorists. So don't, you know, politicians and governments need to worry about terrorism and air pollution? Yeah, I mean, of course, you need to do something about it. And also, of the 25,000 people killed by terrorists, the vast majority uh, are in the Middle East and, and, and the, in the environment. It's not in the EU, it's not in the United States. I mean, in, in, in Western Europe, more people are killed by lightning strikes and by nut allergy and by bee stings than by terrorism. So you really need to, to keep things in, in, in perspective. And yes, politicians sh should still do something about it, but the priorities should be very, very clear also for the media. Again, if you have two newspapers, one newspaper goes with the headline, terrorist attack, and the other newspaper goes with a headline, new study indicates that air pollution, blah, 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 blah. We know which newspaper people will take. And again, it all goes back to our own minds and evolution has shaped us to, to, to notice things in a particular way. And what to do that violence is the thing that attracts our attention more than anything else. It's, it's, you know, it's the same in the movie industry, on TV. If, you, if you're writing a script for a movie and you don't have any good ideas, you just shove a lot of, of either violence or sex inside, and there you have it. You have people's attention. You talk about how the media deals with terrorism and how, how we report it. Um, also, you talk about fake news. How mm. does responsible journalism compete with fake news? How do we dispatch mm. fake news? Well, the, the, the real problem is the model of the news industry. We now have a model of the news industry which says exciting news for free in exchange for your attention. And then the all, again, the battle is for the attention and the truth doesn't matter. You, you don't pay any penalties for untruthful news. You pay penalties for unexciting news, for something that doesn't compete well in the battle for attention. And there is very little, if you live in such a, a model, there is very little that a single journalist can do about it. But we need to change the entire model of, of the news uh, 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 industry. I think a much better model will be high quality news that costs you a lot of money but doesn't abuse your attention. We're in a very strange situation when people are willing to pay a lot of money for high quality food and high quality uh, cars, but not for high quality information. But that's, what it, that's going back to the old model in a way, isn't it? I mean, you know, isn't that model bust? Because people have got used to getting large quantities of information for free. Because, I mean, they should ask themselves, information is so important. It's maybe one of the most important things in the world. Why are people willing to give me this for free? They don't give me free food. They don't give me free cars. Why do they give me free information? They must have some interest behind it. And actually, you know, it's just brainwashing. Suppose some billionaire would come to you and tell you, I have a deal for you. I will pay you $50 a month in exchange. Every day for half an hour, you allow me to brainwash you. Mm. Most people will say, no, 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 no. I don't like this deal. But then the billionaire does something very tricky. He comes and tells you, okay, I have a different deal. I don't pay you anything, I don't charge you anything, and for half an hour, I get to brainwash you every day. What do you say? <laughs> and you say, wonderful, great idea, I, I, I'm in.